hello guys um, welcome to another video and this time we're going to be doing paper 2 from the Northwest trial exams for 2022 okay uh, some of you have requested that I do some more paper 2 for mathematics so we're going to do that um, of course um, do your best to practice remember it's easy to watch me do these things but to do them is another thing okay so get used to trying them out when you struggle don't run to the memo immediately try to figure it out give it a day man don't just give up give it a day to figure it out and then come back and have a look and see what you were missing and then if you still struggle then only then you want to look at the memo otherwise um, there is a memo for this by the way available so you can have a look in case I happen to make some errors along the way then use whatever I'm doing here against that memo I personally don't really like those things anyway why because I mean I want to exercise the mind a little bit so yeah anyway not a big deal uh, also that helps you to not limit yourself into thinking only alongside the memo but let it be a guide if you're getting lost along the way. All right. So let's start with question one. Question one reads, um, a study was conducted among eight volunteers, sorry, employees in a company to understand the relationship between the additional number of rest days given in a year and the productivity of each employee. So it's rest days against productivity, okay, of each employee not a big deal so the results are shown below so we have additional number of days and productivity so it seems to say we want to see if we're giving this what is that so that be basically says that is your x uh, intercept or sorry x uh, axis and then this should be your y axis always that independent is on the x axis the dependent is on the y-axis. I'm glad that they didn't give it to you so that we can figure out which one to put where. Otherwise, we'll end up with something rather wrong. Okay, the question says calculate the correlation coefficient of the data. Now, here you don't want to start worrying yourself. You just go to mode of your calculator and then you go to, f uh, what is that, stat, which is option three. And then you go to option two, which is that A plus BX, because that's our regression for A by variate data. So we just put it in. First one is five, second is two, third is nine, fourth is one, fifth is three, sixth is ten, seventh is four, eight is six so let me see yeah there are eight okay just make sure everything is well aligned on your calculator so make sure when you start one goes with one so five went with 85 and then two went with 63 and then nine went went with 90 and one which is the fourth one went with 56 and 3 went with 70 and 10 went with 88 4 with 72 and then the last one was 62 so you'll see that 8 to 8 is sorted then you just go for AC button the next thing you go press shift and then you come to one stat okay then you go for regression which is five and then you want r which is three and then our r is 0 0.81 to two decimal places okay you just keep it together like that so let's do question one 1.1 1 .1. we know that our r is 0 0.81 okay this one doesn't have a value, right? It's a coefficient. Not a problem. So we are sorted. Now it says, um, what is the story? This 
that so it says now consider the correlation coefficient calculated in question 1.1 and the four phrases below only write down the letter of the phrase that best describes the relationship the variables in the given data or between the variables in the given data okay it says a fairly strong negative well it's a fairly strong yes but it's not negative because we got a positive answer is 0.81 so that's a positive not a negative so as a result that is out very weak well we know that it's a positive correlation but it's not very weak so that also becomes incorrect fairly strong positive I would go for this one because it ticks twice so that should be the one. Let's look at this last one. Perfect. No, it can't be perfect. When it's perfect, it should be almost one or one. Okay. So it's not really perfect. Otherwise, it's a, it's a, it's a positive correlation. But because of perfect, thank you very much. That's incorrect. So for 1.2, we go with C. And then it says, determine the equation of the least squares regression line of the data. Okay, great stuff. So 1.3, we know that our y bar equals a plus b of x. So what is a? Use our statistic mode still. So go shift 1. Then you go to option 5 regression. So press 1 there. I get my a is 56,79 to two decimal places. What would be my b? So here you just keep repeating this uh, process and then B is option 2 there. So I'm getting 3,29. Okay, not a problem. Alright, therefore our least squares regression line is going to be 56,79 plus 3,29 X. That's it nothing serious of course for those two you get a mark and for putting them together so usually three marks is in the bag okay so once you're done here make sure you go back to computing or comp or option one on your modes okay so that you don't run into problems okay so we've sorted that one now it says use the equation obtained in question 1.3 to predict an employee's productivity if he or she was given eight days now you have to investigate this eight where does this eight fall it falls within the domain what is our domain here as you can see they range from 1 to 10 so our domain we know x is an element of 1 and 10 so 8 is in between. So if it is within the domain, what we call that? Interpolation. So get used to these nice terms because you may find yourself being asked, what have you just done? Uh, you will say that is interpolation. Why? Because that particular prediction value is within the domain of the data set that we have. So it definitely should give us a more accurate answer so the answer is y bar is going to be 56,79 plus 3,29 into 8 but remember this is percentage productivity so we have 56 plus ooh, too excited 79 plus 3,29 into 8. So the fancy calculators do this thing. They make it too simple. So this is percentage productivity. Okay. Always try to answer questions in full. Units are very important when you have values at the end of your answers. Okay. So again, how many marks are they giving? There are two marks. I guess the substitution here and the answer gives you the two marks. Okay, great stuff. So 1.5. Um, what is 1.5 trying to do? 
Now it's saying, should the regression line in 1.3 u be used to predict productivity of an employee if he or she was given 30 additional days rest in the year? Explain your answer. I mean, look at that 30. 30 is not here. It's not within our domain, so it's an outlier. So we can answer by saying, no, it is not possible. The reason is because we can say 30 days lie outside the domain, not domain, but not NE, but domain of the given data set. Okay, and so we'll give inaccurate results, and so we'll give poor results. Maybe a poor result. Let's say that. All right, so I mean, you can indulge yourself here with the reasoning as long as you're going to make sense. The answer is that uh, 30 days is outside our domain, it's an outlier, so you cannot really use that to predict this. All right, not a problem, guys. That is very easy, so you get your mark for each. Get your two marks, and there you go with your first nine marks, okay? Not a problem. Of course, I would advise you, if you're doing paper two, anytime soon try to answer those questions first okay of course you have to skim and scan the paper and see whether you can handle maybe most of the questions but in terms of starting always start with the small questions that are annoying because they can be a bit of a situation when you've already been boxed by some serious mathematical questions here all right, let's have a look at question two. A survey was conducted among a number of learners who were using the same cell phone company to establish the number of WhatsApp messages that they sent during a day. The results were summarized in the partially completed cumulative frequency graph, okay? Partially completed cumulative frequency graph or JAI. Whoa. These results were summarized in the partially completed cumulative frequency graph. <coughs> okay, below. Not a problem. Now, you understand what is partial here. The reality is that there are no numbers here. That is the partial part. Okay, not a big deal. Now, let's have a look here. How many students were here or learners? Now, we always know that the correlation, I mean, what you call the frequency, the cumulative frequency number of the last class is usually our total. So if we read this one across, it reads to 450. So we know that there were 450 learners here. And then of course, always the anchor one is the one that has a frequency of zero. So usually it is what lies between zero and the first I mean the upper class of the first class which is going to be between A and B all right so usually that one becomes the lower of that that class anyway ish I'm burning things now multitasking is not for men ah, maybe women are better at this see now I just messed up my meal what am I gonna eat okay so let's have a look at the next piece of information questions oh this there's, there's more all right um now what is that the data shown okay maybe let's read this one much more better the data shown in the cumulative frequency graph is also summarized in the partially completed frequency table. Partial in the sense that there is a Q that is missing there, there is an R, so we need values there. 
Okay, so what we see here is that it's 40 to 80, 80 to 120. So it's in, the spaces in between is 40 units. Okay, so all right, not a big deal. So what is the story here? Uh, remember when we do the cumulative frequency graphs, um, we basically take these ones. We always take the upper values of each class. So, if we think about it for a second, we can simply say, I mean, just take not too much time, but take a moment to get things in order so that you don't find yourself in trouble. Remember, this one is the lower of the first class, so this one was 80. So at B, we're looking at 80. And then that must be 40, right? Because if you say the lower one is going to be 0 to 40 and then you take the upper value, it gives us 40. Okay, so that was 80 and then 120. And then that's going to be 160. And then that's going to be 200. Okay, maybe let's stop there. We don't really want to waste our time too much. Let's see. What is the scale doing here? This is 40. How many small blocks do we have? Or how many blocks? One, two, three, four. So that means the small one here is 10 units. All right, not a problem. So we're going in tens. Not a big deal. Um, now let's answer the questions. The question says, write down the value of A, a tick mark on the horizontal axis of the cumulative frequency curve. Okay. We have established that that would be 40, right? So it will be that uh, lower value, which is going to be the upper class of the previous class that ranges from 0 to 40. Okay, maybe let's do this one on its own. Uh, the intention is to not waste time, guys. I think in this first hour, we need to try and move. Especially with these questions, there's nothing to sit down for here. You just move oh, wrong pen in the hands. Okay, we have question two here. 2.1, we said A is going to be 40, but 40 what? This is WhatsApp. WhatsApp messages. Okay. Great stuff. So always try to answer in full. Okay, you get your one mark here. 2.2. I keep repeating the same number, but I'm reading the next value. H this guy. How many learners participated in this survey? So we worked it out that the total went to 450. So learners. Again, always try to answer in full. Get your mark there. All right, you saw how we got that 450, right? It's looking at the last cumulative frequency value of the last class. So it always corresponds with the total. All right, not a problem. 2.3. It says calculate the values of Q and R, the frequencies in the frequency table. All right, let's start with Q. Q is going to be what? You know that Q is going to be this cumulative frequency adding up to Q is going to be basically 20 plus 30 plus Q, which would be what we plot on the graph. So what is plotted on the graph for that frequency? By the way, let's have a look at Q. It goes with what value? Q goes with 160. So 160 is here at D. So 160 goes with 100. So this is going to be 100 minus the sum of the other two. Right, remember these two were added here. They give us 100. And then when you work it out, it's going to be that one. So remember this is 50, so it's going to be 50. So Q is 50. But now what is that? Is this learners or is it WhatsApp messages? This is learners because remember the frequency 
it goes with the lenses, the number of lenses. So the frequency is of the lenses. How many lenses have messages in that range? Okay, great stuff. And then let's look at number two. So that's the first answer there. Two, we want R. Again, let's look at R. R goes with 200. Okay, so 200 is over here. So if you read that one across, it goes with 200. So this is going to be 200 minus all the others above, okay? The others above were what? We already know now that Q is a 100 here. Sorry, Q is 50. We calculated it. So it's going to be R plus 50 plus 30 plus 20 equaling 200, which is the cumulative frequency number there. And then we're going to take these three from that. So it's going to be minus 50 plus 30 plus 20. Happy there. So this is basically 100, okay? 200 minus 100 is 100. Learn us again. Yeah, my writing is starting to fade. All right, so three marks. I don't know where is the third mark, honestly, guys. So yeah maybe you can get a half for that a half for that just to balance things out to get our three marks it can happen you know yeah trying to get into their mind ish i moved quickly that's why this thing looks faded all right so it says now estimate the mean number remember the mean number of whatsapp messages sent per day okay now let's try and get this one done in this manner. So the mean forces us to do something on our tables. We need to consider two situations now. I didn't want to take long, but yeah. You can use a calculator to do this. It just works. But you need to know the right mode. Okay, so at times just be a mechanic and just work things out one by one. Um, I mean, if you can do this question in 20 minutes, I mean, question one and two, if you can do them both in 20 minutes, you'll be in a good position. Because that's, that's about the time you need to get through those questions. So basically, guys, we're going to look for the midpoints, which we're going to call X. Ne? Midpoints here, first class, is 80 plus 40. That's 120 by 2. It gives us 60. So the midpoint there is 60. And then, of course, you can see the midpoints are going to go in 40s as well. They will follow the class. So 60 by 40 is 100. Right? And then um, you can check this out. This is going to be 200, right? 200 by 2 is 100. And then this one takes us to 140. Again, you can just do it directly. If you don't trust yourself, it's 280 divided by 2. It's 140. And then this one will be 180. So everything, you just add 40 because that little space between them is going to be the very same space between these two midpoints so 180 here and then you add another 40 that's going to be 220 and then 220 plus another 40 is going to give us 260 and then 300 okay those are the midpoints so you can you see that once you get the pattern you can move faster then here you multiply the frequency with x okay now we are going to do this one 20 times 60 i'm getting 1200 and then i'm getting 100 by 30 which is going to be 3000 and then here i'm going to get 50 by 140 i'm getting 7 and then here 
I got a hundred by the way so that one was a hundred by 180 that's 18 thousand okay then we keep going a hundred by 220 it's gonna be 22 thousand all right uh, we keep moving 90 times 260 I'm getting 23,400 and then I'm getting 60 by 300 that's 18,000 okay now of course you need totals here all right so you just add a panel of totals here so we just want to work our magic in the room that's what Jamali says isn't it Ish, where are those girls anyway they don't want to sing anymore eh? actually this total is not supposed to be the one I don't need totals of the midpoints do I mm -mm. I need the totals of the frequency now this is already wrong but I know this is 450 the total of that okay let's put our total there this one we don't really need because what is it we are interested in is this product here so let's see we have 18,000 plus 23,400 plus 22,000 plus 18,000 plus 7,000 plus 3,000 plus 1,200 so what I'm getting here is 92,600 alright so that is what we need guys uh, the rest is not important so we can do our mean nicely of course they say always show what you used so you can show the table but if you used your calculator you don't have to say anything it's just your answer is enough so 2.4 we know that our mean is always shown like that is going to be equal to the sum of the midpoints multiplied by the frequency over the sum of the frequencies okay what was that we got nine two six hundred divide by four hundred and fifty because that's the number of our learners so nine two six hundred divide by four hundred and fifty I'm getting two oh five comma seven seven okay maybe let's say eight now remember this these are messages you can't send a half message right you're sending a full message so messages cannot have a decimal so you're going to take the approximate which is approximately 206 messages of course whatsapp messages if you want that's all right so they were giving two marks i mean here for the answer you get two marks all right no matter what but of course if you use the formula and you used the table maybe you can distribute your marks around not a problem we have to reward some effort okay now the next question says calculate the interquartile range all right iqr you know here we have to go back to our, our child okay no problem so these are our drive so first of all we want q3 where will we find q3 q3 is basically okay let's just first do this 450 divide by 2 is 225 right so where is 225 210 20 225 is here that is halfway okay now we want the lower half so we can divide that by 2 I'm getting 112 comma 5 okay 
110 112 so this is going to lie just above that line let me try and use a bit thinner a pen to do this one all right uh, I'm gonna do that and then okay great where's my ruler now heaven Oh, did you want to do a lap of pangram? Can you believe it? This guy hmm. is losing it. Okay, this is 110. So this is just going to be just above this line here. So if we do this one nicely, of course, it's not going to be exactly accurate because, I mean, it's a very small space to work with. But we will try and make it work. All right, as you can see, this is very close to uh, one one seventy. So we can say maybe one sixty eight. Okay, approximately one sixty eight. That is Q one. Is approximately one six eight okay if you're looking at that distance there of course they will give you a range for the answer because they know it's gonna be a bit silly again we want the half I mean the upper half so all you can do this 450 plus this number here 225 and then that you divide by 2 and then I'm getting 337,5. Okay. So 3, 10, 20, 30. 337,5 is going to be just below that line. Somewhat just below. So the issue here is getting a vertical line. It's a very challenging situation here. Okay. We can put it there. I don't really care, guys. Eh? This thing. You just have the approach. Approach is more important than the rest because other things will just sink you if you don't have a plan. All you want is a game plan here. Don't have a game plan, this thing will play a yo yo on you. Yeah, I see now I messed up. So, ish. I don't trust my anger. Why? Okay, guys, if you look at this thing, it's almost like one. Let's see, what is that F here? 200, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. So this is like 256, 8, somewhere there. Let's just say 2. 55 maybe 256 258 it doesn't really matter so all I can see that though it's almost halfway there so but my ruler is really defeating me there maybe let's say 255 so we know that our Q3 is gonna be approximately 255 okay not a problem so IQR essentially is going to be the difference between the two all right uh, where is my my black pen. All right, ish my feet. These things look so good. So IQR is equal to Q3 minus Q1. We know that Q1 is approximately from the graph, of course, is approximately 168. And then Q3 is approximately 225. We can say therefore I QR is going to be 225 minus 168. Of course, the answer here will vary. So you'll get some range here of where the answer should be. Uh, so let's do it again. Eh? So 
So I'm getting 57. So my answer here is 57. All right, not a big deal, guys. Um, did I take my calculator back eh, before I, I run into problems sometimes? But I don't think that one will be affected by anything. So, no. Oh, yeah, I, I put my own things here. Come on, mister. Eh, this is 255, man, not 225. Eh, 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 eh. You know, problems like to show up, hey? Eh? This is 255. Damn it, man. It's going to work on me now. 255 minus 168. Please, guys, maintain vigilance. So I'm getting 87, okay? Not a problem. Uh, values sometimes will play a number on you, but I think they will be... <laughs> they will see that you messed up somewhere. But yeah, if you write it wrong here, it more or less says you don't know what you're doing here. So you might be in trouble. Okay, guys, uh, that is three marks. So I guess finding these two and the answer here is all right. Okay, now let's have a look at what? Next question. Next question says, the cell phone company wants to introduce a new rule where you are not allowed to send more than 200 WhatsApp messages per day. If this rule is applied to this group of learners on the existing data, how would the standard deviation for the data affect, be affected? Of course, if you're reducing, I mean, look, if you are stopping the, that means all of this is out. So if you remove more data sets, then that means these numbers are going to be much closer to the mean. Um, so the standard deviation basically is the distance between the mean and each variable. All right. So um, can I answer this one here? Yeah, by all means. So we're going to have 2.6 here. It will say the mean. I mean the standard deviation. The standard deviation we use that becomes smaller the reason is that removing data sets further from the mean will will result in a much lesser uh, what distance of data values data sets okay let's just say data sets to the mean Okay, so removing data sets further from the mean will result in a much less distance of data sets to the mean, so to speak. I mean, you're removing the stretch, everything gets closer, so the data sets are closer together to the, with, with the mean or within the mean, all right? Again here, get a mark for that and then you get your mark for a reason. Make sure your reason is making sense doesn't have to be exactly 100%, but it must make sense. Okay, guys, I hope that was fine. So we walk away with our 12 marks here, hoping that we have done everything correctly. All right, now we're going to start doing some serious stuff. Of course, here, you just want to answer as many questions as you can. But those that you feel like they need a, a bit more thought, and if that thought doesn't come to you in about five minutes of trying to think, just run away, okay? Run away, because if you don't run, it will start running away from you. So you just want to not have yourself demotivated. That issue losing marks. 
and each time you get a question wrong then you're gonna start panicking all right let's look at question three anti-bogia Why is this so close? All right, let's have a look here. It says in the diagram below, A with coordinates minus one is to seven, and B with coordinates three is to minus one, and C are the vertices of triangle ABC. So we can see the ABC, okay? The angle of inclination of AC is theta, so it's indicated over there. BC is parallel to the x-axis, already indicated as well and BC is 4 units and that is also indicated okay D and E are the X intercepts okay yeah we can see that this is where this line cuts the X intercepts I mean the X axis and that other line doing its own thing there and then these two are joined okay not a problem so what can we do with this one so the idea is if you have two points okay that lie on the same line we call them collinear points so that means we can determine the gradient between them and if we can find the gradient using the other point we can find the equation of the line and from the equation of the line we can actually determine the y-intercept which is already a constant there and then we can work out the x-intercept as well all right not a problem so that means we can find d we can find where this line cuts the y-axis now what is the other thing now look this is a horizontal line so if we have three there and then we're moving four units to c so at c we know that we're going to be at seven is to minus one because the y value doesn't change but it gives us minus one day on the x-axis so so in effect they've given us the coordinates of c indirectly okay so if we have to explain i will explain that we got that so whatever you wrote remember if they say determine or calculate you're going to have to show every thing that you did to work it out okay now let's keep moving guys we have a lot of work upon us so I think at this point we have two points again on line AC and if we've got two points what can we do we can determine the gradient and we can work out the equation and therefore we can work out its y-intercept we can also work out its x-intercept and of course once we have the gradient we can even work out the value for theta which is the angle of inclination hmm. now the question says write down the equation of line bc okay line bc is a horizontal line so it's defined by the y value where this line would effectively cut the y-axis so if we extend this line it would cut the y-axis at minus one okay so that is the story that we get from all of that okay so let me get my pen so that we can keep moving we've got to move all right not a problem so let's do our movement before we start being shut down they, they announced that they're gonna do some load shedding so ish when it's very dark outside see the weather is overcast so we may not be able to see very well so we know that that line APC is going to be this one y equals minus one so the horizontal line is defined by y values right right so not a big deal so you get your one mark so they said write down so you don't have to explain 3.2 says now write down the x coordinate of c again write down so we worked it out thankfully they don't want it to be explained so x at c is 7 don't even show whether you added 4 to 3 they don't care they said write down so you stop there another one mark so easy stuff you see when you work your diagram you don't sweat too much even if they said sweat you would know exactly what you did all right the next one says determine the equation of the line ac all right so you can say now here 
so you can say here the y at c is equal to the y at b what is the reason we can say bc is parallel to the x-axis so there's, that is the story. Therefore, you can conclude that C is the point 7 is to minus 1. So it's very important to, 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 to try and be comprehensive and also systematic. Then we can safely say, fine, the gradient of AC is going to be Y at C minus Y at B, sorry, at A over y at c, sorry, x at c minus x at a. Okay, just continue here. So this is going to be minus 1 minus 7 over 7 minus minus 1. It's going to be plus 1. So this is effectively going to be equal to minus 1. All right, so we can say this implies that line AC is such that y equals minus x plus c. And then through point c, we have 7 is to minus 1. This means minus 1 is equal to minus into 7. Uh, plus c. Therefore our c when you transpose that it becomes a plus 7 minus 1 which is 6. Therefore y is equal to minus x plus 6. So that was a bit of an exercise but not too difficult, right? Great stuff. So they were giving 4 marks here. I do think to express the full coordinates of that point was critical. Working out the gradient is another critical point and working out the y-intercept is yet another critical point and finally the equation. So this is how I think those marks are distributed. Again, this is just trying to show you where your strengths should be so that you can get marks even if you botch some numbers along the way. Alright, let's have a look here. It says calculate the size of ACB. A, C, B. So we want this angle here. Alright, but now what do we know about this angle? This angle is equal to that angle over there. What is the reason? Corresponding angles. Remember this F, as much as it is turned upside down with these sets of lines parallel to one another, that becomes the same angle. So that means we can use now the angle of inclination of A, C to work out that angle. Then it will lead us to A, C, B. All right, not a big deal. So we have here 3.4. So how do we start that? So we can say, well, I know for a fact that 10 uh, what can I say? Uh, I can just say 10, I want this angle, so I'm, I know that the gradient of this line is going to give me a negative angle, so I'm not going to sweat myself and look for other things here. So I'm just going to say 10 of A, E, D is equal to the gradient of A, C, okay? That is the angle of inclination. Of course, we'll be looking at the absolute value of that one because we're going to get a negative angle, which is going to be minus 1. Therefore, A, E, D is equal to arc 10 of minus 1, which is minus 45 degrees. I mean, this is a special angle. Right. But we can say, therefore, A, E, D is 45 degrees. We take an absolute value of that. I don't want to go the way of doing theta and all that. Nah, it's going to waste time doing the same thing. And then, what we say, but, uh-huh, 
AED is equal to ACB. What is the reason? These are the corresponding angles. You state which, side, which set of lines are parallel. That is DE is parallel to BC. That was given. Okay? And therefore, You answer the question ACB is 45 degrees. Sorted. So, not a big deal. Not a big deal. So, again, four marks. Very simple. I think this expression here. Uh, maybe that or here when you substitute. Maybe you can get a mark over there. And get a mark for getting that angle, get a mark for the statement, and then the conclusion. So 45, but I mean it's like repeating yourself here. So at some point I wouldn't I want a mark here. If you already worked it out and you can provide a reason. Perhaps a substitution here would also be maybe where the mark is rather than here. So this is like repeating the same thing. Anyway, doesn't matter. So we have our four marks there. All right, we keep moving. We keep moving. All right, guys. Um, now let's keep it going. We keep it going. All right. Um, it says now. <coughs> um, if point K is the reflection of E in the line BC, what is BC? It's a horizontal line. So what are we doing here? We're doing a horizontal reflection. Sorry, vertical reflection. So let's look at this in this fashion. So that means we have to look at E and find its coordinates. First of all, especially the X coordinate at E is what we need to find. to this line. But of course, we know that whatever x coordinate at E is, it's going to be the same here. But now when you reflect this point, that means this is your pivot line or pivot point. So you're flipping this over this line. So what are we doing? We're doing a vertical shift. We're shifting this feather down. So that means this point is going to have to be the same distance. It is there to this point from this line. So if this is one unit, for example, we know that that distance is one unit. Okay, so that means this distance too must be one unit. Right, that is how you work this one out. So if you work that out, I mean, this is one, another one, so this is minus two. So that means our k is going to be whatever the x coordinate is there, and then minus two. Then, of course, we have our equation that we worked out. Uh, come here. We have our equation that we worked out, which is that equation. So when we work... When we work out an x-intercept here, it will be that one transposed divided by negative, so it's going to be 6. Okay. So the good thing is that they said write down. So they don't want you to explain a lot of things. Um, you just write down. Okay. So that is core. So what are we going to do here? We're going to go like this and say two, uh, 3 3.5.1. We can state though that E is the point 6 is to 0. It's important to state that, okay? Without stating it, it becomes a bit cumbersome to come down here. We can say, therefore, our K is going to be 6 and minus 2. And they didn't say explain, but you know that the explanation is that if you were to put it forward, you would do it. Then you get your marks, and then maybe that one is rewarded because you had to work it out, but you just wrote it down because 
They didn't say determine or calculate, they said write down. So we stick with the questioning. Always stick with the questioning so that you can lessen unnecessary problems. Calculate the area of quadrilateral B, E, C, K. So where is that? B, E, C, K. So this is the one. It looks like a kite, you know. Yeah, doch. It looks like a kite, this thing. It is a kite, by the way. To say it looks like it's another story there. So this thing is a kite, you know. Why do you know this one? You know that one of the diagonals is cut in half. Okay, so again, this is perpendicular, and you know this side is equal to that side. So even if you look at it in terms of the perpendicular bisector, we'll know that this line is equal to that line. Then that one is equal to that one. So you can use the area for the kite. But I'm going to choose the simplistic view here. I'm looking at this thing here. I know that I'm going to have 90 degrees over there. And again, 90 degrees on the other side. These are vertical opposite angles. Easy. That was a vertical line. That's a horizontal line. So they meet at 90 degrees. So what else is left is for me to realize that, well, I have two triangles. I have triangle BEC with the same base, which is BC, as this triangle BKC. Same a base. What about their heights? which is the distance from the basal side to the one uh, apex or vertex. And we know that this is one unit and that is one unit. So they have the same base, same height, therefore they'll have the same area. So not a big deal. Okay, so we can deal with this one. So we can say area of B is CK back is going to be equal to the area of triangle B E C plus area of triangle B K C. All right, that's just what you can see on the diagram. Okay, now we have a serious statement to make here. Say, but area of triangle B E C is equal to the area of triangle BKC. Now what is the reason? They have the same base and same height. Okay, that statement is important. You can then conclude that the area of BECK, which is back, is going to be equal to two times the area of triangle. You can choose B, E, C if you like. Whichever you choose is fine. Then now let's work it out. This is two into area is half. The base is B, C, which is going to be four units. So we can just start moving here. Four times the height is one unit. Of course, make sure your sketch is detailed so that you don't look like you copied. So this is going to be 2 into 2, which is 4 square units, or unit squared. Okay, that is fine. Again, how many marks are you getting there? 3 marks. Okay, not a problem. So I would suggest that this is key. Ne? I think that is key. And the correct substitution here and the answer. That should be fine. Okay, see, a, a, a three mark question is almost easy to tell how the marks go about, but other questions ish, once you say four or five marks, it becomes a bit situational. Okay, calculate the. Uh, we're done. F is a point in the first quadrant such that it forms an equilateral triangle. BFC. Calculate the coordinates of F. Okay, not a problem. We can do that. So let's start by imagining where is our thing today. Where is it? Okay, so if we have an equilateral triangle here, 
It must do something like that, ne? Yeah. Must do something like that. Of course, it's not going to be exactly 100% because it's a sketch, but we'll capture the idea that it is what it is. Okay. So there is our lovely triangle. I don't know if you can see that color well. All right, there is our equilateral triangle. So what do we know about an equilateral triangle? We know that, well, the opposite sides are equal. So that means all sides are equal. What else do we know? We also know that the angle Are 60 degrees all of them because those sides are equal so those subtend equal angles and then of course from three angles of a triangle we know that well we're going to have a situation like that so we've got 60 degrees 60 degrees 60 degrees okay but now there's another thing that we can do here there's another thing that we can do. We know that if we want the perpendicular height of this triangle, it's going to have to come from that vertex to this side. So our diagram is getting a little bit messed up. So remember this line. If this line is, sub is subtending, <coughs> I mean, it's sort of like being met by two equal sides from the same basal line. It means this line is going to be a perpendicular bisector of this line. So, hey, there's a lot of detail, ne? it's getting boring. So that means it's going to dissect this line into two equal halves. So such that we can now know that the point here is halfway between C and B. And that, because it's a vertical line, it will be the same x value at um, f. They said that is f. So our f is going to have the line, let's just say, first it's going to be x is to y, but we know that if we find the midpoint of this line, because this becomes a perpendicular bisector of this line, then we know that we can have the x-coordinate, but since we have the gradient, I mean the, the angle there, we can use that to find the gradient, and the line and then we substitute the x value to find the corresponding y value so you see when you have a game plan you can just do it but of course since you know that this is going to be 60 as well this is 60 you can even derive another equation here you get the gradient use this point you have an equation gradient that point you have an equation they are equal they can do simultaneous equations so there's plenty of things. Now knowing that this is a perpendicular bisector, you can use Pythagoras on this, okay? Because we know that we'll know the size of this one. Um, yeah, but Pythagoras may, yeah, may work because we know that BC was four units. So this is all gonna be four units, four units. So what we're going to say here, we can use Pythagoras, use this half, use that one to work out this one two we can use distance formula from here to there there's only one unknown once we work out x so you have plenty of options and i would challenge you guys try using the distance formula try using pythagoras try using simultaneous equations and see if you're not gonna get the same answer but how i'm going to approach it is this way i want to work out that by using this perpendicular bisector of bc all right, uh, 3.6. So all I'm going to say here, I know that the x-coordinate at f is going to be equal to the x-coordinate at b plus the x-coordinate at c over 2. Okay, that's the average. Okay, right, 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 right. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to say here. Because I didn't really state what is going on but yeah let's just move on we don't want to stress ourselves it's already getting complicated now we have 3 plus 7 over 2 this is 5 okay so we know that well that is going to be 5 we can say though also what we know that well 
10 say f b c is equal to uh, what am I what am I doing it's going to be equal to the gradient of b f okay not a problem so this implies that 10 of 60 degrees is equal to the gradient of BF. Therefore, the gradient of BF. What is 10 of 60 from special angles? You know there that if you have 30 degrees, 60 degrees, and then 90, adjacent to 30, you have root 3, you have 1, you have 2. Okay? Now, 10 of 60 is opposite of adjacent, so it's basically root 3. Done. Alright, so we have the gradient. We can say therefore BF uh, is such that Y equals root 3X plus C. And then we want to work out the C. Uh, no, 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 not the C, but the Y value. So we can just use a point here. We can say through point B, which is 3 is to minus 1. It's going to be minus 1 equals root 3 into 3 plus C. Therefore, our C here becomes, now we have to transpose all of that. So it's going to be uh, minus 1 minus 3 uh, root 3. That is our C. So therefore, BF is such that Y is equal to root 3X minus 1 minus 3 root 3. Not cube root, please. So that is 3 root 3 by foot. <laughs> Don't kill me for that one. Let's just create some working space over here. And then what do we want? We want to find out the y at f. So we can say, therefore, um, with point f being, minus, being 5 is to y, it follows that y is going to be equal to three, uh, root 3 into 5. And that's what we're doing here, minus 1, minus up in the foot minus 3 root 3 okay and then what do we do here we work this one out it's going to be 5 root 3 minus 1 minus 3 root 3 which is going to be 2 root 3 uh, minus 1 okay that's fine so we can say therefore f is this point 5 is to 2 root 3 minus 1 that's the answer. So, I mean, if you have a game plan, you will always find a way forward. But if you don't have a game plan, it's going to work on your nerves, all right? So you can see that this value is a bit strange, but it doesn't matter. We'll leave it like that, okay? Or you can go for two decimal places. It's fine. It will still be accepted. All right. Um, I think here that is what is important. And then... Um, I don't know, maybe we can just say triangle BFC is an equilateral triangle, you just indicate it like that. So we know that the height of that triangle will cut the other side into a half, I mean into two equal parts. So always revise the properties of these geometric figures. Because if you're not comfortable with that, they will do a number on you and Hey, I won't be there to save you. <laughs> uh, okay, guys. Um, what is the story there? So it's five marks. So technically getting this gradient. You see, once you have more than one mark, I mean more than three marks, it's very difficult to, to know where these things are coming from. But I think getting this equation is important. Three marks. And then working out this Y is important. And probably, probably working out this C is also a critical point, okay? One, two, three, four, five. This one is pretty much just writing it back, so that is where your five marks are. 
that is how you can score this 21 marks okay analytical geometry guys it's nothing to lose marks on of course the very last questions at times can do some damage but if you have a game plan you will always scratch the surface at least but the safest is to do an algebraic uh, manipulation which is try to get those uh, simultaneous equations or you can use I mean whatever is easy you can see you have three options you can use distance formula because now you know that is five but once you've worked out the x coordinate you can use your distance formula or you can use Pythagoras by knowing that this is four units because these, are, these sides are all equal so it's four units and then knowing that this is divided into two equal parts then you can work that out or you just take these angles alone you use that to get an, an equation for that line you use that to get an equation for that line and then you solve simultaneously then you will solve those points so always have a wider view be an eager looking down so that you know exactly where the barriers are okay guys let's just move on before we waste too much time I think we've finished an hour already and I was hoping we were going to have finished this analytical section but yeah we have not so yeah but anyway we can try in the next hour to finish the trick one <laughs> That's if we're quick enough. Okay, let's quickly get to this one. Question 4 says, in the diagram below, a circle with center M and a tangent PD to the circle at P with point being 0 and 6. So they are showing it to us there. So this is the tangent. So obviously, if this is the circle and this is the center M, the radius is always perpendicular to the tangent, right? Mm. That is good. We can just start there. All right. So what is the other story there? So now they're telling us that, um, okay, 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 okay. Now it says the equation of the circle is given by, so they're giving it to us in that expanded form. So once you see that, you're going to have to complete the square to get it into the format that can give you the center, right, as well as the radius. Now they're saying PR is the diameter. So if PR is the diameter, that's good because then it's a straight line through the center. We are happy. And rightly so, at the origin, it subtends at 90 degrees. But it's because of the origin there anyway. Oh, wait a minute. There's the origin. Yeah. But we know that this, okay, the origin is supposed to be 90 degrees itself. But we know that angle subtended by the diameter is 90 degrees so that means this line must be parallel to the x-axis okay so we're already working it out a bit okay now um, they're saying t is a y-intercept and chord rt is produced to d okay so once they say chord is produced we are happy because it says we are having the same straight line okay then they're saying uh, RTD, RTD is parallel to the y-axis. We already established it, even if they didn't tell us, we would know that it is so. Okay, now what can we do here, guys? Fine, we can complete the square and get the center. That's check. And then we have the center there and a point in the circumference. We can actually work out the gradient of that line and work out its equation. Mm-hmm. And then from the equation of the circle as well, we can work out the y-intercepts. What is that point T? We already have one, so we can work out that one. We can work out its x-coordinates, I mean its x-intercept as well. Uh, finding the gradient of this line being perpendicular to that, we can use that to find the equation of the tangent. So literally we can do anything we want. This is a vertical line. If we find the y-value at T, we know it's going to be the same at d and then we just substitute to the equation of the tangent to find the coordinates of d so we can work out everything now let's look into the questions determine the coordinates of m so forces us to go and do completing the square okay not a big deal we can do it so question four so we have 4.1 so we know that, well, the equation of the circle 
first of all you can write m is x is to y okay I can say but the equation of the circle is such that um, x squared we're just going to group this ones plus 6x plus y squared minus 4y minus 12 is equal to 0 so this implies that we have x squared plus uh, we're just going to complete the square here 6x plus you have that you get 3 and then you square that plus um, y squared minus 4y and then you add plus you have that you get 2 and then you square it you move the 12 to this side then you add whatever you added this side is going to be 3 squared plus 2 squared okay not a problem of course this is minus 2 sorry folks making a mistake here with the negative you handle it properly otherwise it will handle you this also implies you take what is under the square then you maintain the original sign you take what is under the square there is going to be 3 then you square that plus and then with the y you do the same you take the original sign you drop that then you drop that sign actually you don't have to put that sign I don't know why I did it yeah don't do it but anyway because it's squared it's gonna be yeah this one causes problems don't don't put the sign here don't know why I got confused or uh, squared and then equals and then here you're gonna have 12 plus 9 uh, plus 4 that should be 25 <laughs> great and then what is the story we can say therefore m is the point minus 3 always take the opposite signs is to 2 we are sorted so what is the story there three marks okay maybe for that and that and then for those coordinates yay don't give too much winner let's just give you one mark there uh, three marks okay here they started you off with some some hectic stuff and then it says determine the length of PR PR is the diameter so we can just say PR is equal to 2R okay yeah you can just say diameter of the circle that's what they gave us then this is going to be 2 times the square root of 25 because r is the square root of 25 that we got over here which is going to be 2 times 5 which is 10 units all right so always put units if they said meters you put meters centimeters but if there's nothing said you just say units whatever is their unit of measurement all right, um, this is easy again, just two marks per four to I guess that is important, and then the answer. Okay, great. 4.3, so I'll call us a whole command. Determine the equation of the tangent PD. Ah, great stuff. So the equation of the tangent PD is effectively going to force us to finding the gradient. So let's find the gradient of MP. So we know that, <laughs> sorry. Um, we know that the gradient of the tangent is going to be okay let's not say that let's just say the gradient of PD they already told us what it is multiplied by the gradient of MP is going to be equal to minus 1 again we can say radius perpendicular to tangent that is the theorem there then this implies what is the gradient of MP okay we want of PD so gradient of PD is going to be minus 1 divided by the gradient of MP which is minus 1 divided by here we can just start by substituting I don't want to waste time so there we're going to take P as the first point so it's going to be 6 minus uh, 2 there 
and then here we're going to have 0 minus minus 3 so it's going to be plus 3 so what we're going to have here this is going to be 2 sorry 4 over 3 right and then this is going to be minus 3 over 4 okay yeah that's how it's going to be we can say therefore the line PD which is the tangent is such that y equals minus 3 over 4 plus c then through point P which is 0 is to 6 going to have 6 equals minus 3 h I forgot my x there minus 3 over 4 into 0 plus c of course why did I even bother therefore c is 6 I mean that is evident I should have just said the y intercept is therefore y equals minus 3 over 4 plus 6 okay that's easy not a big deal so what do we do here three marks wow gradient and the equation uh, maybe correct substitution because the y-intercept is pretty evident it's almost given so maybe that's why you're not getting four marks normally they say four marks here all right guys so that is as easy as that <coughs> now next question says determine the coordinates of d see we already worked out what we're going to do but this is going to force us to finding the y-intercept here because we need it and then the x-coordinate we just substitute the y-value there into this equation then we are sorted we are sorted okay so what we can do here what we can do here I know that I want the y-intercept so 4.4 4. so all I know is that the y at t is equal to the y value at d okay what do I know is that r t d is parallel to the x-axis that's what they told me so that is the story we can say but y is the y intercept of the circle okay center m not a problem so then we can say for y intercept it implies that x equals to zero this also implies now we found out our equation of our circle to be so you don't want to start working too hard there you're just going to say this implies that zero uh, plus three or squared plus y minus 2 all squared equals 25 so you just substitute the don't sweat then what do we do here this implies this is 9 plus y minus 2 all squared equals 25 this also implies that y minus 2 all squared equals 25 minus 9 is 16 take the square root then y minus 2 is going to be plus or minus 4 ne? therefore y is going to be when you add 2 to 4 is going to be 6 or y is going to be equal to then you're going to say here minus 4 plus 2 it becomes minus 2 alright so you can say therefore y at t is minus 2 okay not a problem and therefore <laughs> y at d is also going to be minus 2 because we've made our statement above yeah ne? that was a bit of work we can say but we can say however d which now we know that is x is to minus 2 lies on pd line PD such that we're going to start substituting the so we're going to have minus 2 equals we got minus 3 over 4 then 
you want x okay plus 6 okay therefore our x here is going to be you move that one that side to get minus 8 by 4 it's minus 32 divide by 3 um, sorry by minus 3 is going to be 32 over 3 hey I hope I'm right here don't put me in here where is my question there It is like this, ne? So, <coughs> so I'm happy. So therefore, t is going to be the point. Thirty-two over three is two minus two. Okay. So, so yeah, I think we are sorted there. Um, yeah. So that we can write it down. Say this is 32 over 3 is 2 minus 2 because we found out that that is 0 and minus 2. Okay, great stuff. So we are sorted. We are really sorted, guys. Um, so now we need to get our marks. Where are these marks? First of all, I think working out this is cool. And then substituting here is cool. And working out that x is cool. The fourth mark, on the other hand, is, yeah, there's a lot that was done here. There's a lot that was done, but I think that statement is worth a mark. The rest is honestly mathematical. You know, yeah, mathematical, whatever. And then we are sorted, are we not? Yes, we are. Okay, so these are four marks. And then we do the last question, 4.5. Yeah, ne? I, the time that I thought I was going to be done with this is not happening. Now they're saying now the circle having center M is translated to the right so that, okay, translated to the right. Remember translation is a horizontal, okay, to the right such that the point D lies on the translated circle, okay. So meaning, meaning our little circle here, you have to look at this nicely and easily. If you think about our circle when it gets translated, if this circle lies over here, where is my little thingy there? My thingy is lost again. I like that thing, it helps me a lot. Anyway, so if we're saying D lies on this new circle, such that there's a circle there. So what happened? It, it means we moved this point to that point because this point is directly opposite that one. So we just shifted this circle, these, these units there, and we know that this is 32 units. So to move this point to 32 units, we just added 32, and then it got to be here. All right, so all we did here we added 32 over 3, okay, to move point T basically because for D to lie on this translated circle it means T becomes that point D, okay, number one. And then number two, every other point on the circle is going to move the same way, all right, it's going to move the same way and in fact if we want this circle to come back, R can also come to lie here. You know, our R can also lie here, like that, okay? Because, I mean, this translation, they didn't tell us the limits, but they said such that D lies on the translated circle. So, yeah, D will lie on the translated circle. So let's think about it now. If it lies on, it must be at the circumference, right? 
and then all we know is that to find uh, yeah but I think it's the first one I think it's the first one yeah I think it's the first one because um, yeah I think it's this one here because I said D lies on this circle but it is possible that though yeah 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 both both ways can be possible because remember it can be like that or this circle has been pushed further such that D lies at the end meaning D lies at the space for R okay so this question is a bit silly because it doesn't give you limits as to how this can happen so there's two scenarios here D can represent T it can also represent R so the question is what are the coordinates of R of course we know this is minus 2 over there and then we have to work out R in terms of the circle so there's a lot of things to do here okay let's think about it fine we know now okay it says now here okay determine the coordinates of the possible centers of the translated circle so we want the centers okay that center well it's not a problem but we need that x value at r because it will tell us the distance from t to there so let's work it out we can ch we can start by saying r is the point um, we can just substitute I mean we don't really have to do too much here so if we put minus 2 there for y what would be x where's my equation this one is dangerous here hey what did I do to my paper now Hey, the rain buffet is doing its thing it doesn't want to let go okay let's start here so all we want is to work out what x would be here so we have x plus 3 ne? and then I don't know if we really have to do this one hey yeah ne? yeah 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 so we have to work out the x so we can say from the equation of the circle we've got that x plus 3 or squared plus y now y is minus 2 we can just put minus 2 minus 2 squared equals 25 then we know that x plus 3 or squared is going to be equal to this is 4 so this is going to be minus 4 squared is 16 25 minus 16 is 9 so we can say we take the square root here therefore x plus 3 is going to be equal to plus or minus 3 therefore x is going to be equal to uh, let's see when you move this one to the other side it's going to be 0 or x is equal to minus 6 so we know that well 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 that should take us to minus 6 <coughs> therefore we can say r is the point minus 6 is to minus 2 that r is important because without r we won't be able to work out and we can say here and t is the point 0 is to minus 2 we determined that one above all right let's keep moving guys hey, time is against us greatly 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 I'm not moving as quick as I thought I would so what do we need now we can say this circle we can say now this this circle which center M is translated to the right by 32 over 3 units to point D or this is gonna be 33 over 2 I mean over 3 plus that units because if we move that point all the way there we've moved it that same distance of 6 units 
then we add that one plus six units to the right so we can say therefore m is either going to be <laughs> Uh, what were the original coordinates? It was minus 3 is to 2. So it's going to be minus 3 plus 32 over 3 is to the y values don't change. So it's going to be is to 2. Or our m is going to be minus 3 plus that in situation 32 over 3 plus 6 is to minus wait 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 not minus but is to 2 okay we can conclude again that our m is going to be whatever that is so let's see minus 3 plus 32 over 3 yeah see I keep it. so this is minus 3 plus 32 over 3 plus 6 so this is 41 over 3 is to 2 okay so I've shown how I worked out my stuff of course you can find other ways but I, I, I couldn't find any better way so think of that being this point or that at D being that point when you translate it because they didn't tell us exactly by how much so D can be either this point or that point so that is why we have these two values okay all right guys that was for four marks so I think here we had to work out R we get a mark here for R and then for knowing that these are the units of translation uh, so I guess yeah I guess you get a mark and a mark so we already have three marks now maybe for all of this statement you get a mark also because it is important to capture those two situations so there is our four marks and then we are going away with our 16 marks okay guys I hope you liked it and then I hope there weren't too many errors because yeah, sometimes when you are trying to chase time, there's a tendency to to try and panic, you know. So we're going to trigonometry. Trigonometry, Baba. Which is a very good thing, you know. Trigonometry, Baba. Yeah, it will sharpen to them not. Maybe we can move here now. Because we are chasing the second hour halfway to which I think it's not too bad. It's not too bad. Yeah, can't be too bad. So let's try and destroy this thing in as little time as possible. All right, question five says in the diagram below, f of x equals sine of ax. Okay, now look at that. What is happening here? There is a multiple to the angle, so that changes our period, okay? Our period, we're going to say, the period here is going to be the old period, which is 360 normally, divide by A, whatever the A value is, okay? So that is the story that we can say, but look at the coefficient of sine, it's one. So, well, that is greater than zero, it's one. So if it is one, it's just a standard sine function. So that tells you that the amplitude is one. Okay, so meaning it ranges, the range is gonna be one and minus one. So that's simple, so we are sorted. So already, you try and identify the sine graph here. So I mean, the next one is 10, so the 10 graph is fine uh, maybe this is too far I don't know why my resolution is not the best here okay so the 10 is already not going to be anything else but this is going to be the sine graph so the sine graph is my ruler 
the sign graph is this one. Of, of course they indicated it, but I always like the idea of letting the guys do the thing to demonstrate their knowledge. But yeah, if there's no time at times. So look at that. What is happening to this? It's happening at 45, Baba. Eh, 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 eh. This is doing its thing. It's doing its thing at 45. Okay? So that is the turning point. So we know that this should be 1 because it goes to maximum at 1. Looking at the coefficient of our function there is 1. Okay? So it goes further at 135 because that looks like 135 right there. If it is not, kill me. So it's doing its minimum at minus 1. Okay, so that is the story over there. I mean, it helps a bit to have a look at these things and work your stuff out. So this is going to be minus 1 because we know when there's no multiple and it's positive, or even negative for that matter, when it's 1 before the function, this is what happens, okay? But something strange is happening at 45. Ideally, sign gets to a maximum at 90 from 0. I mean, this is the origin, which is 0. So, it should be doing it, but it's doing it now 45 early. So, that means something happened. So, of course, what you do, you take the original situation for that critical point. It was supposed to be 90 minus, you, you, you subtract, I mean, you divide by the new one. So, 90 by 45 is 2. So, that means our B, I mean, our A value, it means our A value is going to be 2, okay, by looking at what is going on here. Okay, again, it's completed half a cycle at 90. That means a full cycle at 180. You know, half a cycle usually is completed at what? At 180. So you're going to say 180 minus, divide by this new one. Then you're going to get 2. So, I mean, you see, that multiple tells us that we have a 2 there. Okay, guys, before I spend too much time talking a lot of things. So you must know the critical values for sine and cos. Let me just highlight them here. And cos. So these critical values are 0, 90, um, 0, 90, is it 135? I think it's 135. Hmm? 0, 90, so we're going in 90s. From 90 we get to 180. Yeah. And then from 180 we get to 270. And then to 360. So just know these values are critical for sine and cos. A lot of events happen. For sine, this is the maximum. And then for cos, this is an x-intercept. Okay? So know these things. It's like that. They go in 90s. The other ones in between don't really help as much. So this is what you want to know. And then you will start to be able to understand what is going on here. Right. Right. And then, of course, the critical values for 10. Okay, we can just say here, critical for 10. Basically, it's 45 degrees. It's 90 degrees. Uh, 180 degrees. Uh, 270. I forgot 135. Ah, yeah, 135 is there. But anyway, just master this, 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 this two. Then of course you're going in 45s here from 92. It's going to be 135 before 180, then 180, and then all of those things. But what I know is that 10 of 45 is one. 10 of 90 is an asymptote. Okay, so always know this first two. The others may be, may be a bit of a problem, but yeah, just know those ones. I think the order here is wrong. 
So just master those two, that 10 of 45 is 1, 10 of 90 is undefined. Okay, great stuff. So now you're going to use that knowledge to work things out. And then let's look at g of x. It's 10 of x plus b. So this is shifted. But there's no multiple before the angle x. So we know that, well, the period here is the original 180. But there is a shift to the left because there's a plus, but depending on the sign of B, but there is a shift of this graph horizontally, be it left or right, depending on the sign of B. Then, of course, they're giving us the domain that they did this on, so not a big deal. Okay, not a problem. But I want you to notice something. I want you to notice something 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 now you know something here but i don't know if it is going to be visible but look at 90. what is happening to the 10 graph this is that critical point where it tends yeah but it didn't really come out all right so it's right around that point but yeah it didn't really come out properly but it's a milenog but you can tell that at 90 we are doing one instead of doing it at 45 so something happened we shifted this graph to the right so if we shift it to the right that must be negative ne. yeah bo. it's like that it's like that it's like that and then um it usually crosses at zero, right? It crosses here. But now it's crossing at 45. That means we shifted this point to the right 45 degrees. So we know that this is actually a minus 45 over there. So that should be a minus 45 over there. I think that's enough for now. So we are ready to try and answer these questions. They're saying write down the values of A and B. Now we can tell that, well, what was supposed to happen? The critical value, we need to, we're supposed to get a turning point for sine at 90 degrees. Sine of 90 is 1, so it should be doing that. But now it's doing it at 45. So all you can say here is that A is going to be the ratio of what was the original situation for that amplitude of 1. It was supposed to be 90 degrees over the new one now it's happening at 45 so that is 2 so you worked it out but they don't want you to show how you worked it out they just said write it down so we can say here our a is going to be equal to 2 they said write down so you get your mark what about b so we looked at it again and found out that well we shifted every point every critical value for 10 to the right ne. because look we normally get an asymptote at 90 right but look where the asymptote is going to be look this is almost becoming straight over this line here so we're going to get our asymptote at 135 so to speak I mean at 90 but now we shifted it 45 units to the right so everything was shifted to the right so you can just say B is basically minus 45 degrees because when you shift to the right we, we, we subtract 45 so these are the things you just need to know from theory and then you just work them out when you get to this thing so they said right so you get your two marks over there so it says write down the range of F okay the range is from that to that so because of the amplitude of 1 so the range of F we know that the range is equal to y value such that y is less than or equal to 1 greater than or equal to minus 1. It is as simple as that. Or you can say y is an element of minus 1 and 1. Remember these are real values so you can still do that interval notation. All right, not a problem. 
or you can just write it as inequalities alone, standalone, still okay. So you get your two marks there. Not a problem. So this is easy, guys. Write down the period of G. Mm. What is the period of G? Again, they're saying write down. Wait, write down. So you look at the coefficient of X. There's nothing there, so it's going to be 180, the original. So you can just say T is going to be 180 degrees. Sorted. Easy marks, easy marks, guys. If you work this out, you don't struggle. Now it says write down the equation of the asymptote of G for the given interval. Normally we would get our asymptote at 90, but we shift that 45 degrees to the right, it becomes 135. So the equation is going to be X is equal to 135 degrees. Remember it's a vertical line as defined by the X values. So you're getting your one mark again. So do you see, you've got how many marks? One, two, four, six, six marks easily. If you do something, some work. Now start doing some situations now. It says write down, again, write down. Write down two values of X in the given interval where F of X equals one minus G of X. So what I can do here, the first thing you want to do for that last question there, because it will do a bit of a number on someone who's not careful. So let's just do here our question five. It was quite simple, you know. So I'm just going to write 5.5 .5 because the others were answered on the page. I mean, on the question paper. So basically, when you're given this thing, you don't want to stress yourself. You just make sure you get this equation in the right form. This implies that you have f of x plus g of x equals 1. So transpose this back. Now it makes a bit more sense. Because it means you're adding y values of f of x and y values of g of x, which should give us a value of 1. So when do we get 1? We get 1 for f at 45. And this one is 0. So 0 plus 1 is definitely that. So it's going to be 45. And then look at 90 again. This one is 0. And then that one is 1. So we're getting 1. So that means when we're adding these two values here, we get 1. So that is those two areas. So easy now. You can say therefore x must be equal to 45 degrees or x must be equal to 90 degrees. Because you can tell that each one you can tell that each one uh, yeah, you can tell that each one is doing that thing here. So you can use your graph at times you want to calculate but there's no need I mean when you have this situation so easy just take it easy man don't take it don't make it too difficult okay all right um, so you see you need to know a bit of theory about these trick graphs before you can start working on them it's a pity though I don't think I did any videos on this but I think I did some videos where I highlighted this, or is it in my mind? I'm not too sure. Yeah, but anyway, we'll see what we can do about them. I'll do some more so that you get used to this. Okay, guys, so again, you're getting those marks. Easy, two marks there. So 5.6, do you see? You cruise once you know what to do. For which value or values of x in the interval, in the given interval is the derivative of f multiplied by the derivative of g greater than zero. So you know what is that? Gradient at a point. Of course, I know the derivatives in terms of algebra when it comes to this, but don't go there. It's going to be a painful experience for you. <laughs> it's more complicated to actually do the derivative for these trig graphs, but I know what they are, so... Knowing what they are sometimes makes life easy, but I will show some someday, maybe, as we keep working. All right, now we want positive gradients, basically multiplying together, or negative gradients multiplying together. Then they will give us a positive answer. Now, where do we have positive gradients? They are positive. I'm just going to draw one tangent line. 
all the tangents from 0 to 45 are positive, right? And then I'll do negative gradients with the blue one. So all values from 45 to 90, not to 90 basically. You can see here that all the way to 135 basically, we have negative gradients. So the gradients here are negative for our sine function. And yet it's positive here. Okay, so let's have a look. What about our 10 function? So for our 10 function, again you can see that the gradients between here and there hey, I used the wrong color wrong color green is supposed to represent negative so we want to use the pink color yeah now I messed up and my pen may not write after this so you see that gradient is positive here and there. So the 10 graph has gradients that are positive all the way in this given um, domain, so to speak. So there's no negative gradients for it. So they are all positive. So basically that means we have to eliminate because we have to look at this at the same time. So these are both positive gradients all the way until 45, okay? But if you look here, the gradient will still be positive at zero, it'll still be positive there. So, but beyond 45, that one is negative. So the product of these gradients, because you have a positive gradient here, multiplied by negative gradient. So that won't work because it gives us an answer less than zero. So all you have to do now is to just sit back and be like, okay, what is acceptable here? is basically this interval from 0 to 45. Okay, but remember here, uh, the gradient is stationary at 45 for sine, so it's not really positive or negative, it's just zero, okay? So we don't want anything that gives us zero. We want something that gives us more than zero. So 45, as much as we're going towards it, it's excluded. But zero is included because those gradients are still positive there because it's just still going to continue like that on this side. And then that one will also continue doing that. So those gradients will still be positive. So what do we need here? We need x to be less than 45 degrees, greater than or equal to zero, of course, in this given. Okay. 45 is not included because that one is zero. So zero multiplied by any gradient is going to give us a problem. All right, guys, so again, you get your two marks. So see how easy these 10 marks. I mean, if you just work a little bit on your diagram, you are sorted. You are sorted. So I think we have finished two hours now. Okay. Let's try and move. Let's try and move, guys. But I think after this trigonometry, we're gonna have to cut it, you know? before it gets too overwhelming uh, even for me I get a bit wet when I start doing forever I wonder how you guys survived this extent but hey I did them anyway some some time ago so it's not something that is not doable so question six is starting so you always have this terminal arm diagram which is easy in the diagram k k is p is 2 over 3 is a point in the second quadrant t is a point in the positive x axis and obtuse k o t equals theta so it's already drawn for us so always 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 make yourself that nice triangle here because it will make your life simplified it will simplify your life all right um so now what do we need guys what we need is this situation here is to say fine we know that this is p exactly there it's on the negative x-axis it's fine root 3 is the vertical distance and we also don't know that so there's a lot we don't know but let's see what do they say 
write down the value of 10 of theta in terms of p. So it's good because 10 doesn't need the hypotenuse. So this is very easy. So we know that 10 of theta is going to be opposite over adjacent. So it's going to be a root 3 over p. Just leave p positive at this point because you don't know its actual value. So if it is an alphabet like that, I mean a variable like that, leave it as that. Okay, that's all. You get your mark and you smile. Easy one mark. Then the next one it says if theta is 120, now they are giving us something. So this is 120 degrees. Great stuff. Now we can work. Now without using a calculator, calculate the value of P. Okay, now we have to do some mathematical gymnastics over here because we are not to use our friend, but we can use your friend, you know, but make sure you show how you worked it out so that they are convinced you didn't cheat. So let's do question six like so. So 6.1. Then we have 6.1.1. .1. So we said here, tan of theta is going to be the opposite of adjacent, which is like that. Okay, we walked away with our mark. So 6.1.2 says, theta is now 120 degrees. This implies that 10 of 120 degrees is going to be root 3 over p. All right, so they could have just said that and made sure you get maybe four marks at least. You can get it like that. They won't give you this leading question, so you have to f come up with this one. So 10 of 120 is 180 degrees minus 60 degrees. So you do a reduction formula here to show that you're not stealing. But if you stole, then you will start to show up with an answer, then you'll be killed. So they want to see this when they say don't use a calculator. Which you reduce further, this is going to be minus 10, 60 degrees equals root 3 over P. Now you can use your special angle, triangles. If I have my triangle there, there's 60, there's 30. So I know adjacent to 30 is root 3, opposite 30 is 1, the hypotenuse is 2. So now I'm looking at minus 10 of 60 is at opposite of adjacent, so it's going to be a root 3 over 1 equals root 3 over P. Then I want P, cross multiply there, tells me that my P is going to be root 3 divided by minus root 3 which is minus 1. So that is minus 1. So P is minus 1. Done. Three marks. So I think that step is critical. And getting that one, reducing correctly. A winner. Just three marks. So maybe they won't give you a mark there, but they will want to see where it came from then this is important and that is the answer okay three marks in the back not a big deal now let's keep moving guys and then we are given another situation so we are done with that one if cos 42 equals t i mean 42 degrees equals t without using a calculator meaning show every step write down the following expression in terms of t hmm not a problem so once they introduce that, so 6.2, we are told that cos of uh, 42 degrees equals t. So this is the same as t over 1. So how do you define cos? Well, 42 first is an angle in the first quadrant. So we can do it like that, origin. So always make sure you do yourself a diagram. So if we say this is 42 degrees, what should that one be if this is 90? So that angle there is going to be 90 minus 42, blah, blah. it's about 48 degrees. Okay. Now what do we do with that? So you work out your triangle nicely from triangles of a triangle, da, 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 you do your thing quickly. 
and then you want to represent courses defined as adjacent of a hypotenuse so that means if this is one then the one is on the hypotenuse then the t is on the adjacent maybe t is all this distance there now from Pythagoras we know that y is going to be equal to 1 minus t squared I'm just moving fast so you know that this part is going to be the square root of 1 minus t squared okay of course you have to show how you worked it out but I'm just moving quickly so you do all these things before you start answering otherwise your answering is going to start doing things to you now sine of 48 obviously you can already tell you these are co-functions by the way so if cos is positive sine will be the same but look at this diagram at least for now so 48 is that one sine is opposite over hypotenuse so it's going to be the same so sine 48 degrees is going to be t over 1 which is t isn't it true it is true because these two are co-ratios so they look alike they are cousins or are they siblings I don't know identical twins no not necessarily but yeah whatever man so that is t basically so of course you get your mark for that and then you answer I don't know or maybe two marks for the answer doesn't matter hey this phone I never mean hey in the buzzes all right, um, the next one it's cos 84. So now what is cos 84? Now you have to relate this to 42, which is what was given, or 48 for that matter, but 84 is 42 times 2, so it's a double angle. So you, you know that cos of 84 degrees is equal to cos of 2 into 42 degrees easy stuff now this is easy because uh, now use a double angle formula here now cos 2x is going to be what sorry it's 2 cos squared 42 degrees minus 1 I'm choosing the one with cos because I already know what cos is. So this is going to be 2 into cos of 42 is just t and then you square that minus 1 which is 2t squared minus 1. So this is very easy. I don't know why I'm writing like that but yeah it happened. Again 3 marks. I do think to show it like that and then to do the thing and then to do the substitution. Yeah well whatever man. I was supposed to give you a little bit more, but yeah. I'm not giving you more, but maybe the marks is dropped there because the answer has to be a mark. Ne? Yeah. So the marks are here from converting that into identities. And then, yeah, you work it out. So always remember that for this kind of a question, you may need to use identities. So keep them close. All right, so the last one says cos of 72. What is 72? Sometimes when they don't give you a double angle, they will force you to a compound angle. Okay? Compound angles, same idea. You use whatever hypothetical angle they gave you and you use special angles for the other. So that is the key to doing that. So 6.2.3. Cos of 72 degrees. They uh, balagad cos of 72 degrees is equal to what? Now let's check special angles here but we want 42 to feature right because they want this in terms of P so you can just simply say 72 minus 42 if you want but yeah it's 30 so this is gonna be cos of 30 degrees plus 42 degrees but just remember 42 must be present and the other angle must be a special angle so you can't use something that is not special if it is not special it must either be one of the angles in that triangle that we found so it must be one of these angles either use what you have here maybe 48 and whatever or 42 and a special angle 
or 48 and especially angled it doesn't really matter sometimes I can pull you to this one so that you don't see this all right um, let's keep going so this is compound angle for cos so when you expand cos is going to be cos 30 degrees cos 42 degrees the sign changes to sine the first angle times sine of the second angle so cos of 30 from special angles, you know that it's adjacent of hypotenuse, so it's root 3 over 2, multiplied by cos of 42 is t, so this is t minus, sine of 30 is a half, right? 30 is opposite of hypotenuse, times, we got side 42 as t as well, isn't it? Yes. We got it to be T. Hey, 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 matata, ya wena, utoshwa, skayeza tabina. Not sign 42, but we got 48. So that one, sign of 42, is going to be a root 1 minus T squared over 1, of course, which is just the same. Okay, so we know that the common denominator here is 2. So you're looking at your CD being 2. Of course, you don't need to write that there. You just put it down. So all you have is minus 1 minus t squared and then your root 3. And I think that is the best answer you can get to here. There's nothing more you can do to simplify that. It's already rationalized, the denominator. So you don't have to do much. So again, how many marks are they giving? The 5 marks, they are crazy. So they're giving you a mark for that. Then they're giving you a mark for this expansion. Then they're giving you um yeah, ne? maybe a mark for each and then for the answer. Wow, they decided to be generous here. Okay, guys, that's how you can do that one. It's as simple as that. Okay, let's get to some more work. Let's get to some more work so that we can finish this thing at least in this three hours. I would love to get to this one so that we only have Euclidean geometry left so that we just take it easy. Eh? Yeah, man, we must do that. So they're saying, yes, yeah, six simplify. The following expression to one trigonometric ratio so we have to do some serious gymnastics there sine x over sine 2x plus sine 180 degrees minus x of course firstly you copy the thing as it is don't start solving you're gonna be killed Okay, now guys, we have our expression here put nicely before us. Now, there is a method that I showed you guys of how to solve this thing. I will show it again just in case you need it. So I call it a board mass. First, it's a three step. Okay, you use board mass. Or bomb does this is just an algebraic tool of how to deal with expressions arithmetically so to speak and then of course this is brackets off think of that as brackets off and what does that entail reduction formulae when you have factorizations and all those things you handle those things first and then you deal with factors division is going to be factors you're going to handle factors where you can cancel out things in the numerators and denominators and do multiplications if you have to. Then you look for like terms. A and S are interchangeable just like D and M. So you look for like, like terms and then you handle them like that. Okay. That's the first thing you can do. Second thing, you factorize. Factorizations, you have three forms. It's a trinomial where you have two brackets like that or square brackets if you want to call that and then the next one you can have a binomial 
okay where you can take the factor out in one bracket okay let's just say a factor k and some bracket over there usually a binomial can be factorized like that the third time is the dots which is also a binomial but such that you have a difference of two squares okay so whatever you have here is squared minus whatever that p is squared as well so factorization be comfortable with it and then the third one you use identities so I'm just going to demonstrate how we work through that one here so that you don't mess this one up this is equal to sine x there's nothing you can do about it divide by sine 2x first look at look at this thing from left to right term for term of course a little bit of planning will work but just do that so here you can already tell that well sine x divide by sine 2x the common thing here is sine x so you want to can you factorize this thing no can you immediately cancel out no don't have brackets there's no reduction formula to use here they are necessary so the best thing is to go to step three so usually start here most of the time you'll win then the second attempt may need you to do factorization this one identities but here we're already going straight to step two so sine 2x is 2 sine of x cos x okay fine we move on next one say is there anything I can do to this term well there is a bracket so my board must comes back so I must deal with that bracket so this is a compound angle of sine but remember this is so special in that you can use reduction formula so sine x sine in the second quadrant is positive over cos x okay we sorted that one come back here what can we do here hmm what is that sine squared x plus cos squared x we know that that is one but sometimes it's safer to not rush but let's look at this one here uh, we know that that is one fine there's nothing special about it but here this is going to reduce to cos okay so we can already see that well let's try and deal with this one and leave the one at the top so sine squared x plus cos squared x before we start running into problems this is 2 into now sine of 90 plus goes to the second quadrant sine in the second quadrant is positive and what else can we do to take down this thing board mass brackets off this is going to be a core function so it's going to be cos so this is going to be 2 cos of x it's positive because sine is positive so you always follow the sign of the original for the core functions okay not a problem so what can we do here hmm I can say there's a 2 cos there's a 2 cos so we might have some common denominator here all right so let's keep going so we clean this thing up and then we say that one out here we can't do anything don't immediately change to 10 because we already see here you have a denominator of cos 2, x, 2 cos x so you might want to, 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 to leave it for later but that one we need to change to 1 okay so what we have here is 1 over 2 cos x plus sine x over cos x okay minus that one is 1 over 2 cos x and then the next step is do I have a common denominator here yes I have it it is equal to 2 cos x why because this can accommodate cos x and itself so I have 2 cos x here then that one goes once plus and then this one this one cancels out then I have 2 at the top so it's going to be 2 multiplied by the numerator which is 2 sine x then that one becomes minus 1 then you can see 1 minus 1 they go so I have 2 sine x over 2 cos x now what is that 2 and 2 cancel out sine of the same angle divided by cos of the same angle tan of x sorted sorted but in any case even if you changed here at some point and made it 10 of x remember this was going to be 1 over 2 cos x this was going to be 1 over 2 cos x so these ones would cancel out already they 
leaving you there so it doesn't really matter you could have avoided the step all right so do you see reduction formulae are very good but make sure you have this in mind every time whatever step you do you always look can you do this every time can you do this if you use these ones to break the ice can you then use that break the ice can you then use that you will almost always go back to your bomb dust or bod mass all right that is just to simplify things a bit for you but yeah it's not really necessary if you can figure it out just go with it but sometimes these things can overwhelm so having a systematic approach to them can save you a bit of trouble okay guys uh, not a problem that is six marks I'm not even going to say where they are okay done if we reduced it to a single trip ratio chances are we are correct okay great stuff so we keep moving okay guys let's push so that we can finish all the trick here as well so that we just left with our Euclidean so that we can enjoy it in just an hour later but yeah so we have 6.4 6.4 is saying consider f of x is this function over here determine the general solution if f of x is what is going on in there so not a problem so we write our f of x as it is it is sine 2 theta minus 15 degrees times cos theta minus 30 degrees plus cos of 2 theta minus 15 degrees oops times sine of theta minus 30 degrees so this thing can be very long and annoying so we are told here that our f of x is equal to 0 0.8 and we are to determine the general solutions so this implies this whole thing So it means this is what you do and then now you inspect this thing remember if you look here there are some things once you get a complicated situation like that always try to simplify it for yourself look at this angle you have sine of this angle and cos of this angle but remember you have cos of that same angle and sine of this other angle so what does this look like double angle I mean compound angle for sine yes that's what it is so this is the same as sine of 2 theta minus 15 degrees it's always the first angle the sine never changes plus the second angle which is theta minus 30 degrees okay equals 0 comma 8 so you sort it there this you can further simplify and say this is sine of now you these brackets are as good as non-existent really so this is 2 theta plus theta this is going to be 3 theta minus 15 minus 30 this is minus 45 degrees right right is equal to 0 comma 8 so we sort it therefore for our general solutions you know that 3 theta minus 45 degrees is going to be arc sine 0 comma 8 plus k times 360 degrees or 3 theta minus 45 degrees is going to be 180 degrees minus always do that uh, arc sine of 0 comma 8 yeah and doesn't it then don't pay Sega shesh, sega beta, sega beta, sega cool, k times 360 degrees. <laughs> yeah, where k is an element of integers. So, yeah, ya fiwa magunje. 
This implies that we work that one out. So arc sine of 0, 0,8. So I know that my 3 theta minus 45 degrees is going to be equal to 53,13 degrees plus k times 360 degrees or 3 theta minus 45 degrees is going to be equal to then here we say 180 minus 53,13 I'm getting 126,87 degrees plus k times 360 degrees where k is an element of the integers. Alright, not a problem, so we keep working. So now you just solve algebraically. 3 theta is going to be 53,13 plus 45 is 98,13 plus k times 360 degrees or 3 theta is going to be equal to then we're going to have 126,87 plus 45 I'm getting 171,87 plus k times 360 where k is an element of integers. Alright, so we're doing it. So now we can finally solve this one. Say therefore theta is going to be we divide by 3. Eh? So I say 98,13 divide by 3. That is going to be 32,71 degrees plus K times 360 by 3 is 120 degrees. Okay. Or theta is going to be equal to, we come here, 171,87 divided by 3 is 57,29 degrees plus K. 360 by 3 is 120 degrees. Just confirm in case I'm losing my mind. A when. 360 divided by 3, yeah. Okay, where k is an element of integers, yeah. I, I'm getting a bit whacked. So my writing is horrendous again. Alright guys, so general solutions is how you solve them, okay. The sine one is a bit extensive, it's not like the cos and 10. Those ones are easy, just say plus minus for cos. For 10 you just take it as it is. But sign forces you to use this situation here, which is not always easy, so they pushed it there. So I'm not even going to say where these things are, but the situation is that those are the answers. So seven marks, I'm not even going to go about where the marks are sitting. All right, not a problem. We've done the general solution. So when they say general solution, you leave it like that. But if they want values in a certain interval that they give you, then you can do that. All right, so let's do this one. 6.5. All right, it is given that 4 sine, I mean 4 to exponent sine x is equal to 6, and 6 to exponent cos x is 8, and 8 is equal to 32. 2 to exponent 1 minus 2 sine squared x. Okay. Now they're saying solve, sorry, without solving for x, meaning you must not solve for the x value, or you'll not be given marks. Determine the value of 10 to x. Hmm. <clears throat> All right, so what do you do when you have a situation like this? I always choose the most complicated and start working my way to the last. I mean, look, this one is more complicated than this one. So I will start with that one and work my way back. So 6.5. I mean, here you just need to understand exponents, but you're going to use them in that tricky mode, okay? Trigonometric mode. So we know that 8 is equal to 32 to exponent 1 minus 2 sine squared x. All right. So now let's explore this expression a bit 
because there's a few things that we can point out or note. First of all, we don't want to solve for x, so, but look at this thing. What is that? That is some expansion of cos 2x, isn't it? Yeah, well, that is some expansion of cos 2x here. That is what we've got. Great. Two, look at 8. What is the other definition of 8? Eight? 8 is 6 to exponent cos of x. So we can just simply do our thing just like that. Just like that. So this is not really too difficult. But it will cause your mind to think a bit. This implies that 8, instead of 8, you're going to write 6 to exponent cos of x is equal to 32 to the exponent. Instead of writing that one, you're just going to write cos 2x because that is an expansion of a cos 2x. Great. So identities here are at play. But now you have another issue. You are like, wait a minute. What is 6? What is 6? <laughs> So they are telling you that 6 is 4 to exponent sine x. So you want to put all of these things together, nice and easy. Which also implies that you have 4 to exponent sine of x. All of it to exponent uh, cos x equals 32 to exponent cos 2x. Okay. Now... We are somewhere where we want to be, right? Yeah, we, wa we want to be somewhere. But before we get to that somewhere, we have a few problems. But here's what is important. 4 can be expressed as a prime number, right? Which is a 2. 32, we can also somewhat use that as a prime number of 2. Because all we want to do is to drop these bases because these are numbers and we want these trig ratios to come out somewhere but we're going to solve exponentially so first of all let's first solve the situation here um, we're going to have 4 to exponent sine of x cos of x equals 32 to cos 2x okay be systematic don't be in a hurry now what is 4? It is 2 squared to sine x cos x equals uh, 32 is 2 to exponent 5. Let me check. Sometimes I can lie confidently, Baba, and you believe me. 2 to exponent 5 all to cos 2x. Okay. So now we can see we're getting there. So this is going to be 2 to exponent 2 sine x cos x. I mean, you just simply multiply the exponents there. Then this one is going to be 2 to 5 cos 2x. Okay. Great stuff. So once you have powers side by side an equation where you have the same basis, you simply take the exponents. Therefore, it tells us that 2 sine uh, x times cos x is going to be 5 cos 2x. Okay. Great stuff. So that is fine. Now what do we want? We want 10 of 2x. Of course, um, now you don't want to complicate your life here and start converting to identities here. Just take this as it is. What is that? In fact, therefore, what is that? We reduce that to a double angle. This is the double angle of sine, isn't it? So this is sine 2x equals uh, 5 cos 2x. Actually, we can actually solve further here and not even waste our time trying to play around. So once we have this, we want 10. Tan is sine over cos, isn't it? So we divide by cos 2x. What you do on the right hand side, you do on the left hand side. That one goes. Therefore we end up with what? 
10 to x equals 5. Hallelujah. So that is easy, ne? <laughs> so they didn't want you to solve for x, but yeah, you see it comes out nicely when you solve like that because sine of the same angle divided by cos of the same angle is that. So that was a bit of a nice question. Ne? Mm -hmm. Putting exponents into trigonometry. Yeah. And of course, making sure that you suffer to create that link first, which is what makes this a higher grade question. Again, it has five marks, but there's so many steps. I'm not even going to look into where those things are. All right, guys, we're almost done. So we're going to cut this video once we get to what you call. We're going to cut this video once we get to this question seven so that we can enjoy Euclidean geometry alone. So that if you don't like it, it's out as well. So, yeah. Now, I don't know, man. This, this resolution of my screen is really doing a number on me today. Anyway, so let's read. In the diagram below, AD is a vertical pole having height h meters so there it is it's already drawn in and then b d and c are three points in the same horizontal plane so once you see the shading that means these are all on the ground okay a b and a c are cables and angle of depression once you hear that angle of depression or elevation depression is from the horizontal looking down okay so this is the assumed horizontal so when you look down you're forming the angle of depression. Angle of elevation will start from the bottom to the top, right? Mm -hmm. So if that is the horizontal, it must go together with that one. So it means these two lines must be parallel. And in essence, we will have the same angle here, 30 degrees. Ne? That is the idea of what they're trying to give us. Okay, uh, that is 30 degrees. And they're telling us that AB is 3h and BAC is 2x. Okay, so these are all drawn in, so we don't have to worry about anything. Now, what are they wanting from us? They're saying write down the size of ACD. Again, they just said write down. They don't want you to explain ACD, which is that angle. We just worked it out. So if they said determine, you would have to explain a few things how these two angles are linked but now when they say write down you just scrape scrape for some belief some belief though do not be explaining so a c d is equal to 30 degrees that is key so you get your one mark then you go say determine the distance ac in terms of h ac is in this triangle it is a right angled triangle. We know the opposite, we want the hypotenuse. We have an angle opposite that side, so that's sine theta. So we can say here 7.2 sine of theta, uh, sine of 30 degrees. Um, okay, maybe let's not rush. Let's not rush, I'm getting too excited. Sine of ACD is equal to opposite which is h over hypotenuse which is ac okay this implies that sine of 30 degrees is equal to h over ac therefore ac is going to be h over sine 30 degrees what is sine 30 this is h over a half i'm just showing you everything which is going to be 2h okay not a problem just being silly now could have gone very quickly here but I just want you to see everything right right because this is just for two marks and I do believe that this other mark comes from knowing that this is a special angle and then you get your two marks there for the answer all right next one calculate the size of ABD a B D so they want this angle here all right, calculate the size of ABD. So how are we going to do that? A win. He got a remote tatting. Okay, let's think about it. We want the angle. We have the opposite. We have the hypotenuse. It's a right angled triangle, so we can use sine still. Okay, so seven 
3.3 we know that sine of ABD ne, is equal to the opposite which is H over 3H ah look at that H and H cancels this is 1 over 3 okay so therefore our ABD is going to be arc sine of a third so let's do that one arc sine of 1 over 3 yay when is 19 comma for 7 degrees of course those angles you don't try to think about it in terms of the Cartesian plane and all of that you just take it as it comes okay do not start doing your own things you're going to bend ne? please you're not gonna be very happy so that is a bit so two marks I believe getting here and the answer was critical for two marks yeah I'm very tired now but yeah 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 we're going to drive off way to end do our magic here next question says uh, oops is saying here calculate the size of x if bc is 7 h units okay so what do you know here you know this side you now know this side that it is 2h from above we know the angle we know the opposite side to the angle so we can use that big triangle abc to do our cosine rule then it will give us a value for x so it's as simple as that okay so not a big deal guys so this one should be very easy now let us do that let us do that uh, can i squeeze it in here yeah doch. maybe we can try to squeeze it in here if this paper baba is expensive <laughs> okay so 7.4 now we can say in triangle abc I've not been saying this statement for a while now hey eh? what was going on I like to say things like that anyway um, we know that well pc squared is going to be equal to ab squared plus ac squared minus 2ab ac cos of B A C okay of course if they were the reason that is the cosine rule no no problem then we substitute what is B C they said it's 7 H squared equals A B we found out they told us that it's 3 H actually and then A C we found out that it is 2 H minus 2 E 2 whoa 3h h, 2h cos of 2x okay yeah space is really killing me over there so what do we need to do here we can just transpose this one there and then that one here um hmm. What is the best way? Okay, let's just deal with this one. It's going to be 49h squared equals 9h squared plus 4h squared minus 3 by 2 is 6 by 2 is 12. So it's going to be 12h squared cos 2x. Okay, we cleaned it up a bit. So what can we do here? We transpose that there. And then we bring in this one back. Yeah, when? Can we tap? Ouch, 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 ouch. That is square root 7. Yeah, when? 
okay this is what was giving me a bit of a goose bump so so that was square root 7 so basically this leaves us with just 7 h squared I'm sorry for that guys eh? things happen when you are in a hurry now you can tell that this is bigger than 7 so we can do what we wanted to do so this is 12 h squared cos 2x equals 9 plus 4 that is 13h squared and then we subtract 7h squared this implies that we have 12h squared cos 2x equals 13 minus 7 that should be sigiza let's just double check 13 minus 7 hey see sometimes when you've been doing a lot of things can't be too sure so 12h squared that cancels that cancels we know that cos 2x is equal to 6 to itself once to 12 twice is a half and you know that that is 60 degrees nah. mm. so what do we know therefore 2x is going to be equal to arc cos of a half um, therefore 2x is going to be this one is 60 degrees from special angles therefore our x is going to be 30 degrees hey yeah ne? we're dropping we're dropping we're dropping we're dropping okay great stuff so that is how you can get your five marks here just gonna stop it here before we start we, we stole too much okay guys so this is how you could have tackled this paper uh, for this roughly three hours okay of course you have only three hours so <laughs> if you're not explaining to anybody like I'm trying to explain to you you'll realize that you'll have a buffer of around an hour to 45 minutes or so and if you've been doing every question as we have been doing, then you know you only have the Euclidean geometry section left for you to go and rest on. All right. So we're going to cut the video here. And then we're going to continue with Euclidean geometry, which I don't think is going to take us long because it's just some work, definitely some work. But yeah, we can handle it all at once all right guys i hope you liked the video and i hope it wasn't too bad so i'm going to section it into its questions so that you can just zoom into the question that you want yeah but doing it like this is a bit bad in that you don't have the time to indulge you know on each and every question to explain a bit more and also to demonstrate certain techniques but i do i do hope um, at the end I'll do take some questions to demonstrate certain techniques so that you can have that checked and that covered so that as you work these things during your preparation for your finals, you can be in a good position. Otherwise, guys, thank you for watching and for your patience and for your liking that video and for sharing it with your friends and definitely for subscribing for those who continue to subscribe. Otherwise, we're going to keep doing this thing so that you guys can have a better chance. I do hope it works out. Bye. I'll see you in the next video.